Uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit on replacement heifers, and we'll see if we can get this on everybody's uh, monitor. So we got some slides to go with this. Is it on everybody's monitor right now? I can't tell for some reason. Al, is it on? Yeah, we can see it. So you're viewing the slides. It says replacement heifers, I assume. Yeah, we're at. And for me to advance it, it's nice. Yeah, just up or down. What's going on here? Go ahead. I came over to Carrington today to avoid any technical difficulties, and it looks like I stepped into some. There we oh. go. There it is. Yeah. It's supposed to be. I'm sorry. It's not going to go to each side. Go ahead, John. Okay, I guess we got her now. Got her at this end, so I know what I'm looking at. Uh, Typically, our heifer is a, a discounted feeder calf. Uh, we know that in the fall, the sale barn, or if we're selling some calves off the cow, they generally bid us eight to ten bucks back on our heifers. We know our heifers typically have gained a little less on the cow. They'll probably wean off about 50 pounds lighter on average. Uh, there's some reasons for that, and because uh, when we put them in the finishing feedlot, they gain a little less in steers. Their conversion isn't quite as good, and they usually have a little lighter finish weight which means they have a higher cost to gain or, or break even. Uh, today we want to talk about the other alternative with these heifers is to add value with them by developing as replacements to go into the cow herd. Typically we need about 25 percent of our heifers just to replace cows that have uh, been culled out. Uh, right now we got to start questioning if there's room or demand or interest to retain and develop additional heifers to expand numbers uh, the North Dakota cow herd, as of yesterday, I heard we're down to about 860,000 cows in the state, which is fairly low considering we peaked in North Dakota in 1974 at 1.4 million. Been slowly knocking 10,000 to 15,000 cows uh, off our roster for the last couple of years. The high cattle prices we have now and these lower inventories would suggest that maybe people want to rebuild some numbers, uh, especially since we got some grass and moisture or anticipate some forage for next year. Funny thing is, uh, there's some uncertainty whether these prices will, will stick around. Uh, there's also probably been some loss of some pasture acres and CRP and forage acres in the state. And I think for a lot of people who have some mineral income or grain income that's doing quite well, their interest in expansion really isn't that high right now. This here was a headline clipping recently taken out of one of our beef magazines. It suggested nationally uh, prices are not stimulating a lot of retention. We're still selling a lot of cold cows. We're not keeping a lot of heifers. I think maybe in North Dakota... Uh, Tim Petrie, our livestock economist, would suggest that maybe we've started the rebuilding in this state. If we think back to last fall, we had five weight, six weight heifers. They were selling for about a buck twenty to buck twenty five a pound. They were worth six hundred and seventy dollars or roughly that right off the cow. At the time it was a decision do we, you know, uh, put some cash into our operation, sell them. Uh, to somebody who wants to finish them out, or do we retain them and breed them and try to expand or sell replacement heifers? Since then, these prices are about the same, except now the weights are 200 pounds heavier, and these $670 heifers are 870 or, or plus. Just as Dr. Buchanan said, uh, before you go to the bull sale, you, you make the description of uh, what you want the bull to do. I think as we think about what we're going to have a heifer developed to do. Let's think about what her ultimate job is, is going to be. I keep it pretty simple. A uh, cow's job is she got to get bred. She's got to have a calf, raise the calf to the fall. That calf has to be have some market value. After the calf comes off, she needs to go out and get fat and sassy so that she'll come into uh, calving in the right shape uh, four or five months later. And she needs to do that for a lot of years. So in heifer development, we want to find the kinds of heifers, and we want to develop those heifers that can do that. And I would 
certainly think that sometimes our ideal feeder steer and his sister is not quite the ideal herd replacement for many operations. First step in selection is probably to create a pool of the right kind of heifers. And by the right kind, I mean the bulls that sire those heifers are strong in maternal traits, and they will produce heifers that will mature at a right size for your operation and produce milk in the right quantities that your feed resources will support so they'll continue to get bred and stay in the herd. In this here a slide I've just indicated, um, I think cow size is a consideration because as we get bigger and bigger cows, what we're really doing is changing how many animal units or cow units we're able to stock on our resources. Uh, and I think there's some efficiencies in uh, keeping that cow size down, maybe in that 1,300 pound range. Uh, and as we get larger, our opportunities to do terminal crossing and breeding up for heavier calves diminishes. Uh, not that we can't make a choice of what size cattle we want to run, but that should be a decision as we're breeding cows to make heifers what size we do want. Likewise, uh, milk is a trait that there's optimums for. In an environment where feed is plentiful and cheap and high quality, uh, we know a lot of milk in a cow will make a lot of weaning weight. But if that feed is not there, what suffers is reproduction. So we try to match the amount of milk our cows give with the kinds of feed that we uh, have available at a reasonable cost. So we select, for, we select or need to select bulls to sire daughters, which will have that optimum or right amount of milk. And that's a difficult thing to do. We have in the Angus breed on their website a module that you can plug in your cow weight, your feed costs, and it will come back and project to you what they think are maybe an optimum or target uh, milk EPD that you should be selecting for in your situation. I ran this little example uh, indicating some feed costs and that our feed is kind of variable and I suggest in the Angus breed you go buy bulls to save daughters, you should try to find bulls from that 16 to 20 pound milk EPD. If you similarly have got cows that have been sticking around your herd doing a good job, did you know their sires milk EPD, that would be another good target for finding out or kind of honing in on what's maybe optimal for your situation. Dr. Buchanan just covered a, a, a whole lot on selection on bulls. We can probably go through this pretty easily. Uh, we have a number of great tools to identify those bulls that will leave good daughters in a herd. EPDs are one of those great tools, and I particularly like that dollar wean number that he talked about in that it simultaneously puts selection pressure for calving ease, weaning weight, and also moderation of uh, cow costs through to weight uh, and mature size. Um, that particular EPD or index is only available in the Angus Association. We have other good EPDs or traits that we can select for in some of the other breeds such as Red Angus and Semitol, Hereford such as Heifer Pregnancy, Maternal Calving Ease, the stayability he talked about, and also those energy values if Perchance your cows have gotten a little large and now we're trying to put some downward pressure on mature size and feed inputs. The other tool that's just coming on the scene is now uh, taking a, a sample uh, and doing a DNA analysis. There are some DNA markers for a number of traits that have uh, a maternal basis to them. Igenity, one of the companies, is actually marketing what they call their heifer profile where your DNA uh, test for markers in your replacement heifers and uh, included in that are pregnancy rate, uh, weaning weight, mater, uh, maternal calving ease, and marbling and tenderness. From the genetic side, uh, I think we want to keep in mind that there are some advantages in creating heifers that are mixed breeds or crossbreds. The hybrid vigor or heterosis that we see for many traits are, are kind of small when we look on it trait by trait, such as calving rate or calf survival or weaning weight. But when we sum up a bunch of these small little incremental uh, 
advantages. We end up with cows that stick around in the herd considerably longer and produce probably an extra calf or a calf and a half equivalent in their lifetime. So uh, particularly in large herds, we run on a little bit harsher uh, management, run the feed a little tighter to the requirements. I think you'll start picking up some you know, significant advantages from focusing on F1 and crossbred heifers. From a managed standpoint, I've broken this down into a couple different uh, time periods. One is uh, from the breeding of the cow to when we wean them. Uh, we're getting some indication now that we can actually influence the outcome of these heifers or these heifer calves even in utero by insults to the cow during gestation. Um, some work in Nebraska said when they didn't properly supplement these cows during winter, they actually had some heifers that had delayed uh, puberty, had heifers that uh, didn't uh, breed with quite the percentages that heifers that were raised out of cows that were supplemented and taken better care of in gestation. So this starts way back, uh, uh, back in the fall before the heifer or the calf's even on the ground. Once they're on the ground, uh, try to avoid implanting heifer calves that are going to be kept for replacement. Now, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of summary data, and it shows that if you do one uh, low potency implant, you know, at two to three months, typically a branding, vaccinating time, the uh, amount of heifers that uh, are damaged, so to speak, or won't breed is quite small. But if we do other interventions like one implant right at birth or a double implant, another one at weaning, we can start to uh, reduce our conception rates by 10, 15, 20 percent by that aggressive implanting of these heifer calves. Similarly, uh, typically if we know which pastures got the heifers that are going to be kept for replacements, we probably would find a little economic value to creep feeding them. Uh, if there's moderate framed or smaller cattle and good grass and we creep feed them and, and actually have them deposit fat in their udder, uh, we probably ruin, or ruin but diminish some of their future productivity and an added cost. So uh, big growthy cattle, poor pasture conditions, it might not be a big deal, but it really doesn't have a lot of economic value to do so. Then once we get to weaning time, I guess it's time to do your first sort on cattle, get them vaccinated, get their health status right, get the extremes and the off types out of there, and then we got the pool to work from in further development. From weaning up until going to grass and breeding is kind of a uh, not a difficult uh, time to develop heifers, but that's when most of the attention's been of, of what we do. We know if we uh, don't put enough inputs in them, we might not get them bred, and if we put too much in, we might <coughs> further diminish uh, their breeding results and add costs. So we've kind of come up with. Uh, over time, some recommendations for producers of what is just the right amount of growth, and some of that's being, I guess, right now questioned a little bit. But we do know that if we have a weight to the heifer at weaning, or the time she's going into a lot for development, and we know we want her to breed by 14, uh, get bred by 14, 15 months, she has to be puberal by about a year. Uh, and then if we target her gain, so she reaches 65% of her estimated mature weight at breeding, we're going to achieve a very high successful uh, high success rate in getting heifers bred, probably in that 95% range, and it will be fairly economical. And this has kind of been the target weight concept that's been followed for a number of years. In illustrating that, uh, if we have heifers on November 1 that weigh from 470 to 620 pounds, averaging 530, out of a cow herd that averaged 1,300 pounds, we can now estimate how much gain they have to make from now till breeding. And we have a target heifer weight of 65% of the 1,300 pounds, which is 840 pounds. Overall, the herd would, heifers would have to gain about a pound and a half. Realizing there's both light heifers in that pen and heavy heifers, it's probably more economical to sort them. Probably feed one group a little heavier, one group a little lighter. Uh, got a little example of a ration here. The light sort heifers that need to gain 1.7 pounds to reach their target weight of 840. We might have to feed about 6 pounds of grain, plus 
hay, the heavy sort, probably we could uh, only need to gain 1.4 pounds. Just a little supplemental uh, concentrate with hay would probably get them there. As far as nutritional requirements, those uh, uh, heifers that do need to gain a pound and a half cannot do it on our typical forages alone. Uh, typical TDN requirement for those kind of heifers is probably in the mid-upper 60s. Um, most of our forages harvested in the state are probably in the upper 50s to around 60%, so it does take several pounds of grain with forage to get that done. If they're particularly lightweights, small heifers, we need to get into the 70% uh, TDN range in our total ration. It's more likely that we're going to have to feed six, seven pounds of grain to do that. Protein levels tend to be quite low in these low rates of gain on these heifers. We have rations that are 10 to 11 percent, usually that's adequate, and most of our typical haze and with a little grain will do that without a lot of additional supplement. The alternative strategy I kind of alluded to earlier is uh, maybe we don't need to grow them to 65 percent of their body weight, and maybe we can save a little money and do a little more selection on our heifers if we would actually grow them slightly slower to 55 to 60 percent of their estimated mature weight. In doing so, we know that not all the heifers will probably breed or be puberable at the time of breeding season, but what we're going to accomplish in doing this is that we're going to identify the heifers that on lower inputs will breed and will flesh and will be reproductive and will save about $25 to $30 a heifer in feed costs. And this has been documented in both Nebraska and Miles City with some research projects that they've had at, at those centers. And, of course, we don't quite get the same results. We probably back off our pregnancy rates 5 to 10%. But the open heifers that come out of these programs by limiting the breeding season and just getting the best doing ones bred early have been a pretty profitable uh, grass open yearling to sell in the fall. The other thing it does is by not growing these heifers quite as fast, putting quite as much feed input, we tend to reduce the mature cow size uh, 70 to 100 pounds versus some of these heifers that are fed a little heavy in the development stage. Once those uh, lighter heifers go out to, to grass in the spring, they do partially compensate over summer with a little higher gains on pasture, but we also have to be aware that they're coming in just a little lighter in the fall, and we have to get them maybe separated from the cow herd, and at that time might be a good time to make sure that we put a little additional feed into them. Pre-breeding, uh, typically we would give these heifers another vaccination, particularly for our reproductive de diseases such as the Pregard a uh, series of shots. Uh, a standard uh, practice has been to breed the heifers a little ahead of the cows. Doing so, we give the heifers a little more time post-calving to come back into heat. Uh, it also means that our calves out of our heifers are a little older at shipping time, and so they probably fit in better for marketing. As herds have gotten bigger across the state, and people have gone to later calving seasons, uh, I think we see less of that than historically when people were yard and lot calving, uh, smaller herds and earlier in the year. We do have the opportunity with extra synchronization, the tools that uh, Dr. Dolan talked about, that we can actually get, uh, you know, three breeding opportunities for heifers in 45 days by starting them all on a synchronized heat and giving them two subsequent heats, which makes a pretty tight grouping on our heifers. But we're finding with some of this lower input um, winter development keeping some additional heifers back that we've got guys down to probably 30 days of breeding on their heifers uh, and just getting an adequate number for their replacement by doing that with a limited breeding season. As far as what to breed these heifers to, uh, certainly the calving uh, ease EPD and the birth weight EPD are probably our best tools to make sure that we mate heifers to bulls that have a high likelihood of not causing calving difficulty for easy calving progeny. Uh, we did uh, have a trial done at the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center at Streeter in which they compared calving assistance and performance of calves uh, out of first calf heifers that were mated either to low birth weight Angus bulls, and they had a minus 3.5 to about zero birth weight EPD, 
to some real extreme calving ease bulls, low line or miniature type Angus cattle. And of course, either way, calving difficulties were quite low. Uh, heifer calves in either of the mating groups had zero assistance. Uh, steer calves out of the low birth weight Angus bulls had a couple calves that needed assistance. Uh, but we've got the tools uh, to select bulls uh, to minimize calving problems. And high accuracy bulls uh, with calving ease traits uh, make AI one of those things that, uh, attractive for particularly mating heifers uh, for. Uh, the synchronization protocols were covered earlier. We'll skip right over them. Once the heifer comes back in the fall and we PGM and we identify the, the keepers and sell off the opens, uh, we need to continue to develop those heifers. Typically, uh, a heifer needs to gain around a pound a day through the winter so she'll calve at the appropriate shape. Typically, that shape would have her weighing somewhere around 80% of her expected mature weight, and she'd be in a body condition score then of about 5.5 to 6. If we fail to get her there, we can expect more calving problems. We we'll probably can expect more calf sickness and calf death loss, and we certainly would expect slower rebreeding. So it's pretty critical in that first winter that we you know, gear the heifer and her feed and her ration so she calves at an appropriate condition. Uh, a lot of times the heifers can be run with the cow for a while if the cow herd is on a, you know a decent kind of a feed supply and there's an adequate feed so they're not competing with the cows for their fair share. And then as we get into the latter 50, 60 days of gestation, uh, it's probably time to give them a little, uh, sort them off and at least give them a little extra at that time. A couple of things as far as nutritionally on these bred heifers. Feeding a ration that has a couple percent added fat uh, prior to calving, that last 30, 40 days, and then up through breeding has shown to increase rebreeding particularly if they're going to be interred out and the breeding season is going to be on marginal spring pasture. Uh, the other thing is uh, some work uh, showed that sometimes a little bypass protein in these young, continually growing heifers may increase their rebreeding rate. So there's a couple things we can do at heifers that are a little different than mature cows that probably give us a benefit. Feeding some sunflower, some flax, some soybeans, or something like that can add a little fat in the ration or using some distillers or a protein source with a little more bypass nature uh, give us a little advantage. As um, far as what it takes for these heifers in the, in the wintering uh, with their first gestation, it probably takes about uh, late gestation, close to 9 to 10 protein. Uh, if we're going to continue to put weight gain on them, it takes about at a pound a day gain, it would take about a 58% TDN ration to 60%, and that's pretty high quality forage as they get into the latter months of their gestation. Not to forget, uh, with high quality forages and feeds, maybe our calcium and phosphorus and vitamin levels aren't too bad, but it's certainly good to give them a little insurance level uh, by feeding them some supplemental, probably even free choice, uh, trace mineral mix. In concluding, I'm going to just show a little, a little budget here of some uh, costs that go into heifer development. You start with the initial value of the heifer, and back in about the 1st of December, end of November, I said they were probably worth about 670 bucks a piece. Certainly, if we're doing a budget today and going to buy them, people are telling me they're going to cost you close to $900 to buy the heifer today. So that's a, a, you know, quite a bit substantial higher cost than I have here. But the winter feeding at 225, we're probably halfway through that, so maybe you could take half of that off of there. The other pasture, vet, breeding, interest, death loss, and overhead costs are costs I obtained from the adult farm management uh, summary from a year ago. And when we totaled them up last fall, if we made the decision on these heifers, it would have been over $1,100. Uh, now if we put another couple hundred dollars on these heifers, that we might have, you can see that we're going to need a pretty good heifer market to be trying to add value by doing a breeding program. Certainly where we're at in the cattle cycle with the high fed cattle markets, with the high feeder cattle steer markets, we would anticipate that the breeding cattle market is coming along, maybe been lagging to this point, but it's got some potential to be pretty good next fall. If we look at where it's been this winter, 
Uh, this is out of date report. Certainly, they've gotten better than that. Uh, but some of these uh, young stock cows, you know, considering that we were having people sell uh, background feeder cattle in January for nine hundred to a thousand dollars, I think they've been lagging because people haven't been quite as confident that this market is going to last. Uh, fundamentally, we would say that it, it probably should numbers, and I think eventually it will start to strengthen, which it seems to have done now as we get later into the wintering period. For those guys who uh, typically keep their own heifers to replace cows, there's lots of good reasons to do that. It gives you a lot more uh, opportunity to select and make and develop the kind you want. In a lot of years, that's a cheaper option than going to buy them. But in small herds, I think there's particularly reasons to maybe think about buying all your heifers rather than making them. So you don't have to have a heifer bull. You don't have to have another special pen. Just easier to make a nice uh, terminal crossing program and bring it in replacement heifers. And with that, I guess that uh, concludes what I've prepared on heifers. If there are any comments or questions, we'll try to answer them.